but welcome to all of you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, I'm John Bennett, Director of the Athens Institute. It is my pleasure to welcome you uh, to the second Atlas uh, Senior Series event of the semester. Uh, today we have our faculty for all interviews in a second. But uh, the purpose of the, of the Speaker Series is to try to meet great folks here who are doing really interdisciplinary work, and I'll say a little bit more about that as well. Uh, the Speaker Series is made possible by a generous donation from the Superintendent and I'm not for all, and we're very grateful for their support. Uh, if you are if you want to know more about the Atlas Speaker Series, you can look online, but you can also pick up one of these little brochures here and you can see who else uh, is going to be coming here and doing interesting things. So the, uh, today's talk is about an extraordinary piece of interdisciplinary work that starts with molecular biology, computer science, physics, optics, plumbing, robotics, uh, signal processing, I'm sure I'm leaving a few things out. Uh, our speaker is Mark Maxim, who uh, is, other than being a former student of mine from a, a long, long time ago, has a distinguished career. He is, uh, he's the, he was the first software engineer and the software manager at the State Biosciences of California. He built the core software team for the company's groundbreaking products that we're going to hear all about. Uh, he's been an engineer and serial entrepreneur in Silicon Valley for about 20 odd years. Um, he's also a flying trapeze, which is kind of really interesting. Uh, he has a bachelor's in computer science, a uh, master's, and another bachelor's in electrical computer engineering from Rice University. We're really glad to have him. I'm very glad to be here. We have developed a technology we call smart sequencing. And I'll talk about what is smart sequencing, uh, how do you build a machine to do it, and why would you build yet another sequencer given that there are already machines that sequence the machine. So we'll start with a very brief recap of molecular biology. So this is kind of where the story starts. This is DNA. DNA is the source code of life, and it's written in four letters, A, C, G, and G. Adenine, thiazine, and <clears throat> And A's and T's always match up against each other. C's and G's always match up against each other. So each strand carries the full information of the genome. Uh, the fact that the A's and the T's are bound one way and the C's and G's are bound, are bound differently will be important later on. That. So the very brief recap of molecular biology so-called central dogma is that you have DNA and oops, wrong button. You have DNA which can replicate itself uh, via DNA polymerase. It can be transcribed, the process of transcription, into RNA. RNA in turn is used on structures called ribosomes to build proteins from the chains of amino acids. RNA is a lot like DNA, it has one Instead of thymin, it has uracil, um, and the proteins are 20 different amino you know, acids. Proteins are built from chains of amino you know, acids. Uh, so, having established that, this is a computer animation of DNA being replicated. So, what's being fed into this thing called the replisome is a strand of DNA. This enzyme, called helicase, is pulling the DNA out of its double stranded configuration into two single strands. The single strands, one is sort of going forward and one is going backwards, are being copied by these green molecules over here. You can see double strand goes in, single strand goes out, double strand comes back out. That molecule that takes the single strand of DNA and then the free floating A, C's, T's, and G's that are sort of in the soup of the nucleus, that's called DNA polymerase. This is important because <coughs> the researchers at Cornell <coughs> University were studying um, DNA replication and were interested in sequencing 
and it was a group that included a physicist, a molecular biologist, and a nanofabrication expert. And they were kind of hanging out in the student lounge and like, I wonder if you could build sequencing using this molecule, the DNA polymerase. I wonder if you could eavesdrop on a single copy of DNA being replicated, being converted from a single strand into a double strand. And I bet you could do that if you could take the free floating bases and put a dye in them. Because then you get all your C's were blue and all your A's were yellow. And then you could watch this thing cooking, which looks something like this. You could read the sequence as the single strand is being built. So there, a little red flash, and then a G, another little red flash, and you G, a blue flash, and you C, and so on and so forth. And so this was all you know, on the whiteboard 10 years ago. If you could watch this process happening just around the polymerase, you would get red flash and orange flash and yellow flash and blue flash or whatever. And then you would know, oh, well, all my A's are red. So if I see a red flash, that's an A. And then sometime later, you get an orange flash and so on and so forth. And what this would give you <coughs> is fast, long, continuous sequences. I say fast because that animation I was showing you was roughly real time. Inside your cells, when DNA is being replicated, it's about 1,000 bases per second. We call this technology single molecule real time, which is part of a little bit of deep marketing and acronym, but it's not completely contrived. It actually makes sense. So the first problem that the Cornell team faced was that you need trillions of these A, C's, E's, and D's floating around the soup, and they've all got to die attached to them. Well, how would you be able to watch just that one polymerase cooking? And the answer is, <coughs> you build a septiliter microscope. Now, septiliter is probably not a term you're usually familiar with. It's 10 to the minus 21st liters. Uh, it's entirely too small for me to even imagine. So uh, just take my word for it that if you build something that is about 100 nanometers wide and 100 nanometers deep, that volume here at the bottom is uh, it's 20 zeppelin-ish. So here you have all the, what I like to call the, I'm not a biochemist, so I can play fast and loose. Uh, you have the DNA, which is sitting uh, in the active site here of the polymerase. These free floating bases are diffusing in and out, but this is such a tiny volume that they don't spend any time in here. They spend on the order of you know, a few microseconds before they diffuse back out again. Whereas when the dye wanders into the active site, uh, the polymerase kind of grabs it and sizes it up and makes sure it's the right one and sticks it in there and there's a confirmation chain and kind of chunks like a stapler and incorporates it into the next base. So what you get is when you illuminate this from below, you have metal here tunnel in the metal, this is all glass. So you can watch what's going on in this tiny, tiny space. And the reason that you can look at the bottom of it without illuminating all of the molecules at the top, it turns out it's very similar in principle to how the front plate of a microwave oven works. So everybody's familiar with the fact that you can watch your food being cooked without cooking your eyeballs. The reason that is, is because microwaves are about five inches long. But those little tiny holes Riddle of the microwave are much smaller than that. So the microwaves can't work their way through. Similarly, this hole here is substantially smaller than a wavelength of visible light. So if you hit it from below with visible laser light, it can only penetrate a very small distance. It exponentially decays. So basically, you can't see anything up here. This is what a waveguide looks like on a scanning electron microscope. This is a layer of aluminum that was vapor deposited. And this is the glass down here, just straight up silicon dioxide. Uh, this is from the top. We used an electron beam at the Cornell facility, uh, their nanofab facility, to uh, bore these things. And that was sort of the plan. The Cornell team came out to Silicon Valley to try to implement this. <coughs> and it all sounds great in theory, but uh, <coughs> What you get in a functioning system would, in principle, be this. You have the 
polymerase cooking at the bottom, the molecules with the dye tags on them floating in and out. The molecules, the, the dyes are on the other side of the little part that gets cleaved as the bases are incorporated. So there's a sort of little chopping action that cuts the dye off and just fuses away. So you don't get dyes sort of incorporated into the DNA. It's just regular old straight up DNA. And if we zoom in and see the system in action, what it looks like is this. So we have the animation of the dyes being incorporated, and here's what our detector sees. It's seeing these colored blobs. Which make sense. All right. So sounds great in theory. How are you going to build a box to do that? Well, let's see. Who's going to need probably one thousands of these waveguide things with the polymerase at the bottom? We need a way for the polymerase to want to sit on the glass and not on the aluminum because if it's blocking up the walls, then uh, you can't see it up here. Um, polymerase has to function in this immobile state, which is not natural. Normally it's you know floating around and sort of you know going along the, the line of the DNA. Um, you'll need to be able to with high uh, accuracies put you know just green dyes on A's and just yellow C's or some combination thereof. You need dyes that are Spectrally resolvable. In other words, the greens have to be sufficiently different that you can tell, you know, one green from another, one red from another. These funky modified bases still have to work with the polymerase, so they don't look like natural DNA uh, building blocks. Is the polymerase still going to be able to cope with this fact that it's got this dye molecule attached to it? Um, you need to keep the oxygen out so that the uh, enzyme doesn't uh, get oxidized in the presence of all laser light, um, you've got to light it up, you've got to detect it, um, anything else? Oh yeah, well let's see, we're probably going to have to do sample prep, we'll have to have a machine vision system to make sure that the robot works uh, in a very precise fashion, um, lasers, cameras, signal processing, environmental controls, and then you know, a lot of the computer science plumbing that goes into it. Okay, well, that's the reason that it took us six years to go from Cornell team showing up in California to shipping a box. And I'm going to talk about how did we get there and what are the pieces we put into that box. <clears throat> so here's the punchline, skipping ahead. That's our instrument that is shipping. It's installed today in genome labs all over the world. It's called Pack by RS. The upper deck is where the reagents are and the, the sample preparation. Down at the bottom is the optical chassis. On the right is the environmental harness and then all the computers. Most of the computers are really good for results. So, <clears throat> to recap, we have the zero mode waveguide with the polymerase hooking away and we're watching. This is the chip that we fabricate to contain 80,000 of these little holes that we're watching in chemistry. Uh, there's also some of these fiducial patches so that we can get it rotated and aligned and focused um, relative to the camera. Since we're looking at things that are incredibly tiny, we want them to sort of the light to land very squarely on our pixels on the camera. The robotics chassis has, if you go back to the front, we have the reagent drawer and the consumables drawer here. And behind that, here are the reagents, or pieces as I like to call it, uh, that go in these little uh, trays here. These are the chips or smart cells, as uh, marketing likes to call them, that uh, where the, the waveguides are, and they're surrounded by a little plastic carrier where the, uh, the reagents are deposited. And then we have pipette tips. The robot has two pipetters and two chip rippers for punching the chips out, putting them in the sample preparation area over here, cooking them, letting the polymerases sort of wander their way to the bottom of the hole, and the polymerase is there. That a, DNA wanders into the hole, it diffuses in. Uh, and then, when that's all ready to go, then we move it over here to this area where the stage is. So the stage is in this diagram. <clears throat> this is the microscope stage. So, to be able to put the chip in a position to be maximally focused and uh, sort of XY and uh, you know, roll pitch yaw aligned with the, the optics plane where the lights are on the camera, we needed incredibly high precision 
<coughs> and in fact, we have this uh, design has 20 nanometer accuracy using these, these legs. Um, this is called a Stewart platform, and it, it's sort of a, a circular W. And by varying the lengths of these legs, you get X, Y, and Z translation, as well as roll pitch yaw. <coughs> There's also a chip uh, landing area that I'll show you. So this is an example. I don't know if has every bit of mechanical detail of the machine, but here's an example of some of the problems we were up against. Um, we needed this thing to be essentially uh, invariant uh, with respect to temperature, but the very tiny, because on the, the, the nano scale, it doesn't take uh, very much temperature change at all, causing hundreds of nanometers, which is unacceptable. We needed enough range to be able to move around so we have separate motors, but to get high, super high precision, we need these little piezoelectric things that, that form, the crystals that deform in the presence of an electric field and can be manufactured in incredibly high accuracy. Um, and then, Borrow one of John's words and need to build this out of the potential of entertainment and magic steel that doesn't expand the track. There was such a thing. You have flexible carbon fiber rods. And, yeah, and this is just, you know, it's that one little you know, effort in the company to make this particular fancy part involve you know, several engineers and a couple years of work to get right. <coughs> so the, the stage chip plant, the chip gets deposited here in this little tower where. Not nitrogen is pumped in to make sure that you don't uh, oxygenate the solution. Uh, since we're hitting it with a lot of laser light, we're pumping <coughs> the power into this thing, so we have these fans to bring the heat away from it. Um, we, for alignment purposes, we shine light from the back side of the chip, incredibly bright light, and it's able to get through the, the tiny, tiny holes. Um, so that's the transilluminator interface, which sits over it um, before we start the sequence. This is also a fairly complicated machine that I'll try to get fixed. <clears throat> now, underneath the stage that I showed you earlier, the laser light comes in and it gets uh, pumped through a objective microscope. The laser light coming in is not just like a big flood laser, um, because that would be very inefficient. You'd be spraying laser light all over the bottom of the chip. What you want is to have it deposited in little tiny beamlets. So there's a diffractive element ahead of this, you can see all these little lines in here. This represents the fact that the single laser beam is split into 80,000 little dots that exactly match the shape of the chip. <clears throat> and we have two colors as well. So now you've got a chip, and you've got to put 80,000 little green beamlets on it, and 80,000 little red beamlets on it, and hold them there for you know two, three hours while you're cooking the reaction with you know, 50 nanometer accuracy. Also turns out to be a significant, pretty challenging problem. So the illumination light comes in, uh, bounces off this mirror, comes up to where the chip is positioned. The light coming out of the dye molecules comes down here, and then this optical element uh, called a dichroic basically shunts everything that isn't the laser light off this way, and then this comes over to where the cameras are. And this is a, a schematic of you have the laser, you have focusing uh, equipment, you have a little power meter. There's an attenuator in here, and there's a shutter as well, that's what that is. Um, the beams get combined, uh, imaged onto the waveguide array, and then when they come off, there's a splitter that says red light go this way, green light go that way, and then there's another one that says a okay, slightly greener light go that way, slightly less green light go that way. So it's basically one camera per dot. This is what the instrument looks like from the side, sort of putting it all together. You've got the cameras, you've got the objective, the stage is over here. Here's the robot in, in the sort of leftmost position. Um, we have the environmental chassis over here, which has got water bottles for humidification. Um, we've got a heater, we've got an air conditioner to get the humidity the way we want it. Um, we have to chill the cameras because they generate a lot of heat. Chip plant needs to be a particular temperature. A cutter needs to be a particular temperature. It's like the Bay Area. There's all these microclimates inside the instrument. Um, <clears throat> and then we get to the computer part of it. So here's the computer hardware in sort of block diagram form. So we have these cameras for imaging the waveguides, and then we've got these other cameras that are used to position the robot inside the instrument to do the pipe heading and the chip placement and all that stuff. Those are the 
those go into a box called the NRT, not very happy with the name, not real time computer, um, which is working with the real time computers that have uh, the talk directly to the hardware, the day, the robot, graphics, control, all this stuff. Um, it's a little power little power proceeding. <coughs> then we have the also fairly poorly named primary analysis pipeline. It's primary analysis is the word we use, the phrase we use for signal processing. Um, this is also a Linux box. We also have a, a graphical user interface PC in front of it, and then there's a big switch inside that is everything in the And this has some security stuff in it, so you can get in. So, even though we have that hardware, where's the software? So, we have sort of the basic instrument control application that sort of coordinates and uh, does the scheduling and mixing with the agents and the timing of what goes where, when, turns the cameras on and off. And <clears throat> that talks directly to the machine vision, so that we have the robot. We also have the camera driver for acquiring these images in real time. These cameras are 2,500 by 2,500 pixels running at uh, 100 frames a second. It generates basically a DVD worth of data every second. To process that data, we convert these images into what we call traces. That's the squiggly lines of the different colors. And then that is shipped off instrument over the DD <coughs> to the next level of data reduction, where we go in and we look at the squiggles and we find the pulses, where we have signals that go beyond the noise threshold so you can say that's probably an incorporation. Trace the pulse is then, the pulses are the bases, depending on what color they are, uh, and then we do what's called consensus when we're looking, well, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but <coughs> when you read the same molecule multiple times, then you can average out the, the, the random errors in the reads to come to a, a more accurate uh, idea of what we have. And that's all shipped off instrument to the environment that is computers at the customer site. And we have a graphical user interface. <coughs> Simple one for customers and then a fancy one for the uh, So this incorporates a vast array of just different software disciplines. So real-time control, resource scheduling with the protocol stuff. Um, there's some nice you know, engine card problems in there. Um, we have to do the optical alignment to get the chip positioned in the right place, capturing data at a very high rate, we've got process the signals. Do some machine learning to figure out uh, to figure out how to map the pulses to the bases and so on and so forth. Um, automatic user interface. So you put all that stuff together, and you have the chip, and you have the chemicals on the chip, and they're all blinking like mad. And one hole <coughs> is generating data that looks something like this. This is the trace that I was referring to, and it's got all these little pulses on it. And you can see that so the, the blue and the green, or they're basically both green, so by convention. These are the green dyes, the T's and the A's, and then the red and the yellow. And you can see that <coughs> the dyes overlap. So you have these two red dyes. You're getting signal in both channels. Like so, the two red cameras typically will see every red and slightly less red pulse. But in this case, we see oh well, there's more of the yellow signal, so that's probably an A. And over here, well, there's more of the red signal, so that's probably a C. And that gives us a little <coughs> bit of extra information. Other system, if they make a mistake, it doesn't give you sort of any information about what it might be. If it's not the thing you think it is. In other words, well, this base incorporation here, it's almost certainly an A. But if it's not an A, then it's almost certainly a C. It quite definitely isn't a T or a G. So that's a little bit of extra information to get out. All right. <clears throat> so we started with what is single molecule sequencing? How do you build a box to do it? And then it begs the question. Well, why would you do that? So, <clears throat> compared to other state-of-the-art sequencing gear, uh, the PAC Biosystem has several of these features to help get into one by one. Basically, we can get rapid results, low bias coverage, long read lengths, uh, high consensus accuracy, epigenetic data, and there are other single molecule applications I'll talk about a little bit. <clears throat> so, a 
I won't say competitor spots, I will say complementary sequencing technology that generates lots of data cheap um, has the advantage of generating lots of data cheap, but a typical run can be up to eight days. So you can imagine if you're a scientist and you want to test a hypothesis or something, then you have to wait eight days to get your data. It um, can be a little frustrating. Or if you have a patient that has some pathogen and you want to know what the pathogen is and you don't want to have an assay for that, it would be really nice to be able to find that much quicker. Um, and the sample prep times are comparable. But basically, as soon as we go lights on in the box, the data starts coming out of that real time. And as soon as those pulses start coming out, we can start calling the faces, we can start doing the uh, alignment, and putting it all back together, and finding out you know, what exactly is in the flow. Uh, this is an example of the uh, New York Department of uh, Department of Health. <coughs> um, they sent us a uh, Influenza that didn't match any of their existing influences, and said we'd like to uh, sequence this. And we were able to basically turn the answer around nine hours from when the FedEx showed up the same. <clears throat> uh, another feature of our technology is uh, we call low bias coverage. So remember before I said that the A's and the T's have two little hydrogen bonds, and the C's and the G's are connected by three hydrogen bonds. <clears throat> Other sequencing technologies have trouble with the G C rich regions of the genome. They're sticky. And I don't know exactly the, you know, the hardcore grungy details, but <clears throat> it means that it's easy to read places that have lots of A's and T's or just sort of a reasonable amount of A's and T's. But once you get into C's and G's, it's like mud. It's a lot harder to read. You know? um, <clears throat> uh, a typical uh, other sequencing platform, uh, so normally the distribution of A's is um, the Poisson distribution, but they uh, tend to read more out of the edges. Uh, the PacBio, the same sample, the, the amount, the reads that we got out of the machine matched exactly to the Poisson distribution. Um, why do we care? Well, first of all, there are interesting regions of the genome that are nothing but sequences. And in some cases, they're uh, long segments of this. Uh, so, one example is a gene called FMR1. Uh, your normal genotype uh, has a certain number of reads. And it's not a, a single point mutation. It's a how many do you have. If you have more than about 55 of them, uh, you get this, this uh, syndrome, uh, which is sort of a mild form of fragile X. And then if you have more than that, then you get this fragile X syndrome. I, I don't know if the horrible repercussions of having fragile X are in the This is also implicated in Huntington's disease and my and so on. So, an example of it's nice to be able to measure these things accurately. Um, another uh, capability that our box has is very long reads. So, competing technologies, complementary technologies, uh, can read uh, up to 800 bases or so. And that's pretty good. Um, but given that the human genome is 3 billion base pairs times 2, it's hard to see large structure with that, especially when you have repeat sections on the order of you know 10 or 15,000 bases. You chop it up in all these little tiny pieces. It's hard to know if you have five copies or six copies or seven copies of the gene. Or if the cancer cell has made a mistake and took a big chunk of it and flipped it backwards or something like that. It's hard to see these things. It's also difficult when you're encountering an organism that you've never encountered before and you don't know what the chromosomes, how the chromosomes are structured again. The more little tiny pieces you chop it into, harder is to figure that out. So the, uh, the PacBio box will give you 800 bases in the first 10 minutes. And then if you let the thing run for a couple hours, you can get 4,000, 5,000, 10,000. This particular read from a couple years ago, we got almost 13,000 bases. And we're getting now upwards of 30,000 base pieces in the lab. <coughs> and what you get when you get low bias plus long reads finished genomes. So this is an example of a bug uh, that Hugh Washington was studied. I believe it's, uh, they're interested in it because it emits uh, hydrogen very efficiently. And using uh, complementary technologies, they were able to get it down to 58 pieces. But they couldn't figure out how these pieces went together or in what order. Um, so they uh, took their existing sequencing data and they 
they did a what we call a hybrid assembly, our data and other uh, sequencing data put together into a single copy. And a finished genome uh, really does tell you a lot about uh, sort of an organism that a, a bunch of little fragments would find. And it's important because in the microbial gen bank, uh, more and more organisms are being sequenced, but as time goes on and these shorter read technologies are coming to dominate in laboratories, the percentage of unfinished genomes is approaching 50%. And the, these are uh, three uh, types of sequencing that have come on the market. These will give you four or five hundred base reads, these will give you 75 base reads, and these will give you 50 base reads. And you can see as the read length has been going down, it's getting cheaper to do this stuff. The lots of amount of genomic data that's being recorded and analyzed is going up, but the number of finished genomes is going down. So we're really hoping that as people adopt our instrument, that that number, that you can go back and finish genomes with only a little bit of additional information. Um, another capability that we have is what we call uh, single molecule consensus accuracy. Um, that when we layer these reads on top of each other, since there's no systemic error in our system due to GC bias and other good things, that <coughs> random reads can be made to or the random errors that are inherent in reads can sort of cancel each other out. If you read it six times, you can get 99% accuracy. As you, you know, layer the reads on top of each other, once you get into the 22 coverage, you can get you know, five, six times the accuracy. Um, and the way we can do this is not just uh, on sort of a, a large sample of DNA, but with an individual molecule of DNA is by creating what we call a smart belt. And it's because this thing looks like a dumbbell. The, the principle here is you take a section of DNA that you're interested in, and through careful sample preparation, you put these little bells on the ends. And so what happens is the little DNA polymerase reads it forward, and it goes around the bell, and then it reads it backwards. And so any errors inherent in, say, C's are getting canceled out by the fact that you read the A's on the other side. And it goes, it's my animation. This is what it looks like when it's written. And with uh, a thousand base reads <coughs> a couple years ago, when we were, before we really went to uh, read like problem, you can see uh, we can take 140 bases and read it forward, backwards, forward, backwards, forward, backwards. Uh, this is a 3,000 base read that we read forward, backwards, forwards. And as the number of coverage steps goes up, the accuracy, because this is the number of representation of how many nines does. So this is four nines. So another uh, interesting thing that our machine can do uh, is look at epigenetic data. What is epigenetic data? Well, as I started with, the central uh, dogma is that there's A's, C's, D's, and G's. That's it. Um, well, it turns out to be somewhat more complicated than that because if it was just A's, C's, D's, and G's that determined how your cells function, right, then everything would be a stem cell. Right? Somehow genes have to get turned on off. And one of the ways this happens is through a process called methylation. Disclaimer, it's not a black And two of the examples that are frequently found in humans is 5-methyl-C and 5 hydroxymethyl c Basically, additional little molecular groups are added onto these things. And they cause the upregulation and suppression of gene expression. And so, like, the difference between a hair cell, a liver cell, a muscle cell is which genes are being Expressed. This is also really important in cancer genetics because oftentimes in the cancer cells, genes that are supposed to be off, like the signal to replicate like crazy, get turned back on again. And so cells can be, from a sequencing standpoint, a traditional sequencing standpoint, identical and yet completely uh, functioning differently. So in multicellular organisms, uh, some of the common base modifications that have been found so far are these methylated C's, methylated A's. This is another form of C. Um, I believe U is a modified T, and I don't even know what that is. Big hairy mess. But apparently, it, it turns up in nature enough that it has biological significance. Um, this stuff is almost in its infancy because it's hard to read. But there's just, you know, it's 
scientists are just getting a handle on this stuff. Um, and in single cell organisms, there's a bunch of other uh, net, uh, modifications that turn up in bacteria and viruses. And on top of that, you have various forms of DNA damage that are caused by um, radiation, ultraviolet or x-ray, uh, by um, carcinogens, uh, and other environmental stressors. <coughs> and all these things affect how your cells function when they interfere with a proper DNA. And some sequencing technologies can kind of infer that there's a 5 methyl C, but pretty much none of these other ones can be read at all. Uh, and the base modifications come up all over molecular biology. And again, it's, it's a very fruitful area of research. Well, what is it about our machine that lets us look at these things? Well, so here's the polymerase that we saw earlier. Here's an example of a methylated A shown in red. What happens is, since the methylated A is a slightly different shape, it kind of gums up the work. It doesn't stop the DNA from copying it, but it takes longer for the sort of thermodynamic processes that are jiggling these things around in the right position from going as fast. What you get is if you have a methylated A, there's this gap between the base incorporation and then whatever's next. And in the non-methylated A, you can see that caught on its heels, there's another pulse. Now remember, these pulses vary, energy pulse distances vary, but when you take a single strand of DNA and you run it around and around and around, we get enough looks at it that we can say really convincingly that, oh look, there's a long gap and there's a short gap. In fact, it shows up really clearly when you sort of plot inner pulse distances around it. So you can show that, that those are definitely methylated. Uh, another sort of key thing about our system uh, is that it's a DNA sequencing instrument, but it's, that's not the only thing. What it is, it's a single molecule microscopy platform. We just happen to pick DNA sequencing as like the first application um, because you know, marketing people said that's what we should do. Um, but if you can sequence DNA, then you can just as easily, as it turns out, drop an enzyme called a reverse transcriptase, which converts RNA back into DNA. You put an RNA template in there and you use the exact same nucleotides. So again, we're not converting into RNA back from RNA, back into DNA, so we can observe that. <clears throat> um, and this is useful, for example, you can take a cell that has a bunch of RNA kicking around in it, and you can extract that, sequence the RNA, and then you find out uh, what's called transcriptome. In other words, what did that cell have functioning in it at that particular point in time? What RNAs were getting transcripted into proteins, but what other RNAs were doing other these various RNA things? Um, you can also put a ribosome at the bottom of one of these wave guides, and you can tag some of the uh, amino acids and watch proteins in the wave guides as well. And this is not something that was released commercially, but it's something we would like to use. And going forward, there's all these other interesting possibilities for things that are in molecular biology that someone who's a molecular biologist would be able to tell you about in more detail. But uh, that's basically it. So these instruments, they're out in the field. People are using them. They're publishing papers. It's pretty exciting. Um, these are from a lot of the labs where we've installed our instruments all over the world. Um, and we have a vast array of people that have helped us, uh, collaborated with us from uh, all the way from our, our very first customer, uh, Washington University of St. Louis, the Center Institute, you can see um, some of the people are on our scientific advisory boards. Uh, some people helped us found the company. And of course, as I said at the beginning, this work represents many years of a diverse array of incredibly talented people who work their butts off uh, nights, weekends, holidays uh, to make this all happen. And there are people in sales and support and out in the field to keep them going, and there's researchers figuring out how to use them. And it's just incredibly exciting. Any questions?
Well, it's, you do have extra information in our technology for, as I said earlier, the, if it's not an A, it's got to be a C, because those are both the red tag ones, and vice versa. Um, I'm not in a great position to sort of do a comparison contrast with uh, the other technologies, other than to say they involve making many, many copies of the DNA before you put it into their detection apparatus all the epigenomic, epigenetic data, um, and also if there's any mistakes that happen while you're going from a single copy of the molecule to the trillions that you could look at, um, if there's mistakes that are made in there, uh, it's a chronic memory process, you can lose some information. So, well, so you go from your fluorescence to the DNA Turns out that we have many, many different error sources. Um, sometimes the pulses are too narrow. Uh, sometimes a base will sit in there for a little while uh, and then get rejected, and that shows up as a, a false positive. Um, there's a lot of light, which is optical noise. So our, our raw read accuracy is about 85%, which sounds really low. In that 85% is the you know 0.01% inaccuracy of the DNA polymer. So the, the replication uh, error is completely swamped by all these other error sources. So how many molecules do you need to read to get a reasonable error rate? Well, uh, one molecule can be sufficient uh, if you put it into a loop and run it around. How many times do you have to run it around? Well, it depends on sort of what accuracy you're satisfied. So how long, how long a piece can you do that with? Um, well, right now it's limited by, so there's this trade-off. We have sort of a maximum read length at the moment with our current chemistry of around 30,000 bases. So if you were to take a 1,000 base segment, you could read it forwards and backwards, forwards 15 times, roughly backwards 15 times. Um, if you wanted a bigger segment, you wouldn't get as much forward and backwards. If you had a smaller one, you could you know, get 20 or 30x coverage on a single molecule. That's the so currently, this is an example of when we have six, six, six fold coverage and we're getting into the satellite. You know, if you're familiar with uh, the technology, the thread source. Mm -hmm. okay. So this, we can get to thread 40 with six fold coverage, but we should be going after this. Um, How does the input size length trade off with those capital platforms? I don't know. I can't authoritatively speak to that, but I don't. Sample size is remained by basically uh, putting in uh, ligases that chop up the DNA at sort of certain intervals. And one ligase will give you, on average, 2,000 base chunks. Another ligase will give you, on average, or a combination of ligases will give you 100 base chunks. So I think it's just a matter of you know, which two of you pull off the shelf and dump it into the sample. But looked a little bit like Moore's Law. So as time has gone on, sort of the log of the reads has been uh, going up pretty consistently. And it's just a matter of understanding uh, why the system shuts down, why a given hole will go silent. Um, and originally, we had problems getting the DNA to sit still, or sorry, the polymerase to stay in place. <coughs> Some of our early guys uh, had a problem where if you hit them with too much laser light, um, 
they would form free radicals, and those would latch on the polymer and so forth. That's when we realized that we had to do very careful oxygen exclusion to minimize the radical degree. Basically, there's you know, a bunch of really smart you know, biochemists who play with chemists and cosmologists uh, messing around with well, what if we put in this additive, in this antioxidant? You know, how can we quench dyes that are you know, ionized and free radicals? So there's a whole raft of things that we're sort of knocking down one at a time, and it's you know, double the number of all those kinds of things. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to go, we'll be able to speed up the polymerase uh, and really lick the, uh, the shutdown problems. <coughs> our, our next raft of chemistry is much better than our previous way. It's, uh, it's a, having a, a distribution sort of looks like this, and the short readings and the handful of long readings. I have a couple questions. The first is, do you guys have the same problem with poly A's or sequences where you have the same nucleotide yeah. over and over? Okay. Um, but it's you, less than the, the 454 or the Omnichrome. Okay, can you do anything on the fact that you've got a little bit more information to be able to decipher for those? Well, that's where we have our machine learning experts trying to figure out uh, context sensitive sequencing. So, the shape and the width of the pulses varies a little bit depending on whether or not a C follows an A or an A follows a C or a bunch of C's follow each other. Uh, and basically what we do is we feed in a known sequence, uh, a bunch of different known sequences, and we're training uh, an expert system basically to say, oh, well, I know that in this context, the likelihood of a fat pulse being two separate C's instead of the, uh, for the uh, other folks in the audience. What he's talking about is you have a whole raft of C's next to each other, how do you know if a little dip between two pulses means you actually have two pulses, or was there just a little dropout in the light that was coming out of it? So if you have 10 C's in a row, how do you know it's 10 C's or 9 C's or 11 C's or whatever? Uh, other technologies have a little bit more problem. Um, and the answer is that that's an error source for us. Just kind of a follow on that, on yeah. the fact that you've got, if you have the same, same molecule in a bunch of nearby wells, do you have the same problems of being able to get uh, saturation in the camera? Now the, all wells are just completely independent of each other and they have all their own you have a single seat camera. Single camera or each there's, well? There's four cameras. Each, well, each, the 80,000 waveguides are imaged on all four cameras. So each camera has a hole that represents you know, red, slightly more red, green, slightly more green. Um, and there's a little, basically there's a little box there's sort of a dead zone there's very little crosstalk from one another. Um, we also, you know, each piece of DNA is independent. So all these holes are just completely separated from each other. The system has no clock. Uh, if you put in 80,000 different samples, they're all going to flash at different rates. So the acid rate, and they're all sufficiently separated from each other for detection. So, <coughs> we, so we would love to have a very clever system that puts one and only one in each. Uh, but what you end up with is you put in the polymerase with the sticky side down and shake it up, wait, and then you diffuse coming out. And uh, you end up with a Poisson distribution of some of them have zero, some of them have one, some of them have two, and so on and so forth. Uh, basically, we just tweak the amount of time that we let it sit there and the concentration of the polymerase to get to the theoretical Poisson maximum. So that number is 37%. Um, but a good sequencing runs at this point. Um, and it's something that we would like to do better at. But you know, some optimizations you can get a factor of 100. The best we can ever do with this is to get a factor of 3. So that's not the most high So when you have the circular DNA, your response out DNA. Uh, <clears throat> do you attach some duplicates to your polymerase so that it will simultaneously cut that double strand and then continuously copy? It turns out not to be necessary that um, these uh, cells have a little bit of DNA on the inside, but this section that is single stranded uh, when it's synthesized, back to that. 
there's a section here that's single stranded at the time of synthesis, and the polymerase will latch on to that single strand, and that is the primer. Right. But when it goes all the way around, can you oh. it for a second oh. time? No, I understand what you're saying now, sorry. <coughs> um, uh, it turns out not to be necessary. This is a particular DNA that we discovered in a phage. So this is not human DNA. Human polymerase. This is a this is a, a viral polymerase, uh, and it is a strand of displacing. This is a strand displacement uh, polymerase. And so when double-stranded DNA starts being fed back into it, once it gets around the loop, it's going to peel off one of the strands. So one more question, you have the primer, okay. but let's say within your, your sequence here, you have uh, more than one gene with a stop codon, perhaps. So how do you prevent the, the DNA from stopping on that stop codon? And so stop codons only come up in transcription, and DNA polymerase does not do transcription. It only does the replication. Team or perspective, or like a management team? Uh, either one. I, I just wondered, it, it seems like that the process here is that you've got the forest and the trees, the, the forest being the overall process, and the trees the individual uh, discipline. Right. So, so, who were the people who could have the overview or the vision that could make this whole thing work? I would say that the, the two most critical people were the two out of the three founders um, Steve Turner. Was a physicist by training, uh, and Jonas Korlock, uh, a entomologist in the lab rooms. And those two guys collaborating together uh, were the ones who sort of did the initial hiring of people who you know, were later disciplined. Like nobody has enough brains to keep this whole thing in head. But Steve and Jonas are extraordinarily smart individuals. If anybody was going to sort of try to keep the highlights, it would be them. But they, they hired some really excellent. David Rank has been in the sequencing business for a long time. He had a couple of buddies from grad school who were excellent sort of chemist troubleshooters. And some of us picked up disciplines that were you know, almost entirely new to us, you know, just because somebody had to do it. And there were a lot of meetings where people were sort of talking across each other. <laughs> we just locked the door until. A lot of times, you know, we would try things and they were just completely at random on them. That's why I think it's interesting. So, that's that process. I'm going to take the rest of the questions offline and thank Mark one more time.